There are few things within Warhammer 40k that manage to capture its essence quite as perfectly as the Space Marine Chaplains. Now, All it takes is a single look at these guys to know what they're all about. Their aesthetic manages to combine the brutal efficiency of Astartes warfare with the spiritualism and dogmatic creeds of the Imperium into a single lethal warrior that radiates both sacred significance and an aura of imminent violence. No matter if you're a newcomer to the setting, a 40k veteran, or even an individual that claims to not be the biggest fan of the Imperium, everyone has a favorite Space Marine unit. But did you know the Space Marines themselves also have a favorite unit? And that honor without question goes to their company chaplains, the Team MVP. The chaplains are both spiritual leaders and loyal sons of the Emperor that are often said to be the beating heart of any Space Marine's fighting force. Each and every one a symbol of the Emperor's purity and an avatar of his divine wrath. And as undeniably badass as the chaplains are, they do present a pretty puzzling conundrum. With the exception of a small handful of chapters such as the Black Templars, the Space Marines are not religious in nature. They do not worship the Emperor as a god like the rest of humanity and are firm adherents to his imperial truth. So if this is true, why are the chaplains so widely used by the Space Marines? What use do a bunch of super soldier atheists have for power armored priests? What exactly is a chaplain? What is their role within the chapter and how are they utilized in war? Who were the first chaplains and how did their usage spread to the rest of the legions? And what's the deal with their skull faced helmets? I mean, they look badass and all, but what are they supposed to represent, and why does it seem to be only the chaplains that wear them? Well, in this video, we're going to get to the bottom of that and a whole lot more, as there's a lot to cover with the chaplains. But before we dive headfirst into the grimdark, a quick shout out to this video's sponsor. If you haven't started playing Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus yet, there's never been a better opportunity to start, as everyone's favorite machine-worshipping Martian cultists are finally getting added to the game. The Adeptus Mechanicus, also known as the Tech Priests of Mars, are the guardians of the Imperium's technological secrets. They blend the zeal of religion with a mastery of all things mechanical, and their ultimate objective to relentlessly pursue power and knowledge, forever seeking to venerate the divine trinity of the Machine God, the Omnissiah, and the Motive Force. Much just like how they are portrayed in the lore of Warhammer, the Adeptus Mechanicus units in Tacticus are a faction where the fusion of flesh and machine ascends warfare into a precise strategic form. They harness devastating arcane weaponry and cybernetic augmentations to outmaneuver and outgun their enemies. The members of this faction are going to get rolled out one at a time. You can play as the Tech Priest Manipulus right now, and the Tech Priest Dominus will be added on December 24th, with the Indomitable Skitari Marshal following up on January 7th. If you've been watching my channel for a while, then you know I'm a big fan of Tacticus, as it's the perfect pick up and play kind of game. It has fast paced and intense matches that never feel too overbearing. Not to mention it's absolutely chock full of content. From multiple full length faction specific campaigns to PvP arenas, guild raids, salvage runs, and so much more. Download the game for free today by clicking on the link in the description of this video. And whether you're a new or returning player, use my code WESTMEC12 to get 2,000 coins, 50 Blackstone, and one requisition order for free. Big thanks to Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus for sponsoring this video. Although it's true that each and every one of the unique and varied Space Marine units play an important role in the body of any Adeptus Astartes fighting force, none would deny that at their core, the chaplains serve as their beating heart. Each and every one, a holy soldier of legend, a warrior priest that inspires their brothers to acts of great bravery, even in the face of impossible odds. They are the keepers of their chapter's legacy, the historians of its lore, and the preservers of its ancient traditions. Each commands an awe-inspiring presence, and through word and action, they rally their brothers to war in the name of their Primarch and the Master of Mankind. The words of a chaplain command such power that by recounting the tales of space marines of the past, singing hymns to he on earth, and unleashing bellowing war chants, even the most downtrodden and weathered group of marines will be imbued with an invigorating second wind, a righteous zeal and divine hatred of the enemy that propels them once more into the den of devils. Armed with a sacred Crozius and protected by the refractor field of the Rosarius, the chaplains can always be found fighting on the front lines where the dangers are their most numerous and their sacred guidance needed the most. They march across the battlefield, singing praise to the ancestors and delivering the Emperor's divine judgment to the alien, the witch, the mutant, and the heretic. 
all purged in his name. To their allies, a chaplain is a glorious beacon of righteousness, the bearer of the emperor's sacred light, and an avatar of his wrath made manifest. To their enemies, they are sinister figures clad in jet black power armor that radiate holy purity. To stare into the eye lenses of a chaplain's skulled helm is to stand in judgment of the emperor himself and to ultimately be found wanting. Every single chaplain is a veteran of dozens if not hundreds of wars, their talent for inspiring their fellow warriors matched only by their lethal combat skills. They are the emperor's holy avatars and the honor of the chapter given human form. When the battle is at an end and the enemies of mankind lay slaughtered before him, the chaplain will speak his liturgy in a clear voice. He will give respect to the bravery of the living, give the right of passage to the fallen, and retrieve their sacred war gear. He will do all of this with reverence, even when exhausted by battle and weary from the field. For it is the chaplain's duty, his burden, and his satisfaction. So with that tastefully dramatic intro out of the way, uh, what exactly does a chaplain do? What do they specialize in? Well, at their core, it is a chaplain's primary responsibility to maintain the spiritual, mental, and emotional well-being of their brothers, a task that is easier said than done, as although space marines know no fear in terms of a fight-or-flight response, they are not immune to other types of fear, like the fear of failure, or to the plethora of other emotions commonplace among soldiers. Grief, sorrow, regret, anger, wrath, these are all things a space marine must deal with on a regular basis, and it is the chaplain that takes care of them, encouraging their brothers to fight onward even when things seem their darkest, to keep hope alive and to never let them for even a moment forget who they are and what they're fighting for. For any fighting force, it's a lot easier to live up to lofty ideals of heroism when the enemy arrayed before you quickly crumbles and you suffer minimal losses. It is, however, those moments where the outcome is not clearly defined, where in a split second the tides of battle turn against you, where victory seems like an impossibility and morale begins to deteriorate. This is when the chaplain shines the brightest. Through the power of word and deed, the chaplain holds his unit up spiritually, emotionally, and even physically if the situation demands. No man left behind, no mercy for the enemy, and no rest until the day is won. Space Marines are widely known for displaying traits of heroism in the face of insurmountable odds, often snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. However, many such battles were only turned due to the courage, inspiring presence, and uplifting words of a unit's chaplain. So to summarize, uh, the chaplain is by far the Space Marine team MVP, though you could make a good faith argument for apothecaries as well, but this video isn't about them. They'll get theirs in their own deep dive. Beyond just chanting the chapter's battle creeds, they will also minister to the fallen and grant absolution to the dead. They preach that the battlefield is one of the greatest places to give praise to the emperor by casting down his enemies, for nowhere is faith more thoroughly tested than on the front lines. They rejoice in the glory of war and push their battle brothers to show their devotion through their actions. The importance of a chaplain's role in war cannot be understated, but it's not limited to active battle zones, as trauma has a tendency to linger like a cancer just under the surface. And although it may surprise you to learn this, the Space Marines are not immune to trauma just like none of us are. When not in combat, the chaplains serve as a psychiatrist-therapist hybrid, teaching their brothers how to navigate through life as one of the Emperor's angels as well as constructively deal with all of the trauma, hardship, and grief that comes with living a life of constant war. That should come as no surprise that in most chapters, it is actually the chaplain's responsibility for inducting new aspirants into their ranks. They will serve as a guiding force for these youths as they go through the long and arduous process of becoming an Astartes, their mentorship persisting throughout their careers. Now conversely, they are also responsible for weeding out weakness and keeping an ever watchful eye for the telltale signs of corruption or insubordination. A friend of mine once told me in a joking manner that space marines are child soldiers and the chaplain is like their guidance counselor. Which, I mean, it's a joke, but why does it have to be so accurate? The chaplains are the keepers of a chapter's legacy. They catalog and recount the tales and great deeds of space marines of the past, keeping their legacy alive by making sure their stories will continue to be told long after their inevitable deaths. Through their sermons, they teach their brothers of the chapter's history, tradition, and culture, whilst instilling in them the wisdom of their Primarch and the Emperor of Mankind. 
for it is only through faith that the Space Marines have any chance of standing against the darkness. No two chaplains are exactly alike in the way that they preach or monitor the spiritual well-being of their brothers, as some take a firm but ultimately understanding and compassionate path, choosing to uplift spirits by reminding their brothers of the great deeds of fallen squadmates that are no longer with them, whereas others have been noted for being notoriously strict in their expectations and fiery in their preaching, instilling a righteous hatred of the enemy. Most chaplains fall somewhere between the two extremes of lovable guidance counselor and hard-ass drill instructor. To illustrate this further, I want to share with you two examples of different chaplains, Mortius, aka The Bull, chaplain of the Ultramarine's 5th Company, and the hero of Hell's Reach himself, Grimaldus, reclusiarch of the Black Templars. The first example comes from Book 2 of Marnius Calgar's trilogy, Calgar's Fury. It was written by Paul Kearney and released in April of 2017. For context, this group of Ultramarines, as well as several explorators of the Adeptus Mechanicus and an Inquisitor, are stranded on a Space Hulk that has been taken over by a Chaos Warband. The group is absolutely exhausted, and they realize that the only chance they have of surviving is to make it to the Control Room, a task that at this point seems like an impossibility. Morale is low, and the threat of impending death lingers just above their heads. Chaplain Mortorius dropped back and began blessing his brothers, sloshing through the stinking water, his crozius held high and blazing again. He alternated his blessings with stories of the Ultramarine's heroes of old, speaking to each Space Marine by name, complimenting him on his deeds, remarking on their collective appearance with a dark wit that had the brethren laughing over the Vox, setting his hand on their heads and calling them to remember past glories and the darkness the chapter had known in the past. He was a pearl beyond price, and Calgar heard Mortorius' words still echoing in his own mind as he went down the line. Some Space Marine chaplains held that their brothers needed nothing more than thunderous sermons to keep their faith true and unsullied by doubt. The bull was subtler than that. For all his fearsome reputation, he knew what it took to keep fighting men's hearts high. Sometimes a little cajolery, a little self-mockery went farther than a pious reiteration of chapter dogma. And yet, his faith was solid as a mountain. A good chaplain was not just respected or feared, he was loved. It was not a distinction that could be readily understood by those who had never stared death in the face time and time again, and it was as true for Adeptus Astartes as it was for lesser men. Calgar had known many Imperial Commissars who were rigid and unyielding in their orthodoxy, their blind allegiance to the tenets of their training. But the mark of true greatness was the ability to look beyond it, to remember the humanity of those who put their lives on the firing line, to make misgivings into a joke, to laugh at death in the company of others who faced it also. That was a truth as ancient as warfare itself. I love this excerpt because to me, it demonstrates that there's a lot more to being a chaplain than just giving fiery speeches and preaching no mercy for the enemies of mankind. When everything seems lost and your brothers see nothing but darkness ahead of them, to be a chaplain is to be the light that guides them back out of that darkness. It is to keep spirits high and hope alive. It is to take misery and loss and channel it into gallows humor. It is to remind your brothers of what they are fighting for and, in some aspects, help them hold on to their humanity. However, different situations call for different approaches, and in the novel Hell's Reach, written by Aaron Dembski Bowden, Grimaldus has no time or tolerance for the soft-handed approach. The orc invaders are pressing in, and in very short time will overrun the defenders of Hell's Reach. One of those fiery sermons I mentioned earlier was exactly what was needed. Now, I know when I'm outmatched, and I cannot possibly do Grimaldus justice, so I'm calling in an expert for this one, Chris Tester of the Naturally RP voiceover channel here on YouTube. Not only has he voiced multiple Warhammer characters in the past, but he's got that quintessential 40k voice that breathes life into many of its characters. If you're not subscribed to him already, you definitely should be. Now, for context, Grimaldus and the Steel Legion defenders of Hell's Reach are standing on the wall, overlooking the wasteland as tens of thousands of rampaging orcs can be seen in the distance. Grimaldus raises his crozius and points out at the enemy before turning to the crowd of frightened mortal men and women and says this. Do you see that? Do you see that? Are you all as insulted as I am? 
This is what they sent against us. This is what they sent, this rabble. We hold one of the mightiest cities on the face of the planet. The fury of its guns sends all skyborne enemies to the ground in flames. We stand united in our thousands, our weapons without number, our purity without question, our hearts beating courage through our blood, and this is how they attack us! <laughs> oh, brothers and sisters, a legion of beggars and alien dregs wheezes its way across the plains. Forgive me when the moment comes that they whine and weep against our walls. Forgive me that I must order you to waste ammunition upon their worthless bodies. I have heard many souls speak my name in whispers since I came to Hell's Reach. I ask you now, do you know me? I am Grimaldus of the Black Templars, a brother to the steel legions of this defiant world. Never again in life will your actions carry such consequences. Never again will you serve as you serve now. No duty will matter as much, and no glory will taste as true. We are the defenders of Hell's Reach. On this day, we carve our legend in the flesh of every alien we slay. Will you stand with me? Sons and daughters of the Imperium, our blood is the blood of heroes and martyrs! The Xenos dare defile our sacred city. They dare tread the sacred soil of our world. We will throw their bodies from these walls when the final day dawns. This is our city. This is our world. Say it! Cry it out so the bastards in orbit will hear our fury. Our city! Our world! Run, alien dogs. Come to me. Come to us all. Come die in blood and fire. For the Templars! For the Legion! For Hell's Reach! If you're watching this video, then you're most likely aware that, with the exception of a few chapters, most famously the Black Templars, the Space Marines do not actively worship the Emperor as a god, contrary to the Imperial cult being the dominant religion of mankind. So if this is true, what need do Space Marines have of faith? For the Space Marines, faith does not come in the form of a religion in the way that we would traditionally think of it. But make no mistake, each and every chapter has its own Space Marine cult, complete with its own history, traditions, and symbolism. Theirs is a faith that eschews the worship of deities and embraces religion of warfare and of a veneration for the ancestors. One where they may not worship the Emperor as a god like the rest of humanity, but they venerate him as the greatest man to have ever lived, one who was infallible and whose teachings were absolute. To deviate or reject the Emperor's wisdom is to blaspheme against him, the Chapter, and the Imperium. That is to say, it is an act of heresy. So in this sense, the beliefs of a Space Marine Chapter have more in common with religion than they may want to admit. It is the Chaplain's job to ensure their Chapter's purity of spirit by continuously monitoring for weakness of faith and ensuring that their brothers uphold the wisdom of the Emperor, the Primarchs, and the Space Marines that came before. And when it comes to the Space Marines and the Imperium, religious symbolism tends to pop up pretty frequently, despite if we're talking about the 42nd millennium or the 30th when the Emperor still walked the stars. Many people wonder why the Emperor would be okay with this, why he would actively seem to encourage religious symbolism even though he was a staunch atheist. If we want to take a little bit of a meta perspective on this, it's because the designers of Warhammer 40k have designed the Imperium to be dripping with Catholic symbolism. It's part of what makes its vision of the future so uniquely gothic and grimdark. For the longest time, the Horus Heresy was basically just a footnote in the Imperium's history. We really hadn't started diving into it as a setting until around 10 years ago in the real world. So in this sense, the designers and writers of 40k are having to work backwards when expanding the lore of the 30th millennium. There's this fine line that they have to walk of preserving the identity of Warhammer 40k, but also presenting to us as the audience an Imperium at the height of its power before it became dominated by superstition. The meta perspective aside, I've heard a lot of people's different takes on why the Emperor allowed this, why he actively used language, architecture, and symbolism with a uniquely religious connotation. 
But the take that I like the best is that even though he was against belief in deities, he had a profound respect for and desire to preserve the history and culture of mankind, a culture and history that was profoundly influenced by religions of the past. Additionally, he was well aware that words had power. He didn't call his conquest of the stars the Great Journey or the Great Expedition. It was the Great Crusade. Not to mention the most obvious example, where he called his space marines his angels. His angels of death. And if the term angel doesn't have religious connotation, I don't know what does. In this context, it stands to reason that when the original chaplains were created, of which we'll get into their early history in a little bit, he was perfectly okay with the nomenclature as the word itself has an ancient and powerful history. And speaking of that history, fun fact, military chaplains are totally a real world thing and have been used for hundreds of years. The United States military, for example, has an actual chaplain corps. And although these real world military chaplains do not carry weapons like their counterparts in 40K do, what they do have in common is that they're trained to offer guidance, therapy, mental and spiritual well-being to every possible denomination of person. And the wisdom they share is not only spiritual or religious in nature. For real-world soldiers, no matter how dark things get, no matter what happens, the chaplains are the ones that are going to be there for you. With them, you always have someone to talk to. The chaplain's the guy that's going to be there after you've seen something so horrific that it changes you forever. They're going to be there when somebody dies or when somebody gets maimed. What they're trained to provide is simply invaluable, and personally, I have an enormous amount of respect for these guys. Although each and every chaplaincy within a chapter has its own unique structure, for the most part, the ranks of the chaplains go like this. At the absolute top, you have the Master of Sanctity, also known as a High Chaplain. They are the master of a chapter's chaplaincy, and thus oversee everything within its cult. Whereas any given chaplain monitors the spiritual well-being of all of their immediate brothers, it is the Master of Sanctity that sees to the spiritual health of the entire chapter. Beneath him are the reclusiarchs, who oversee the reclusium, maintain its holy relics, and are primarily responsible for the training of new chaplains. Beneath them is what we would consider to be a regular chaplain. And further down the line, we have the judiciar, which admittedly are kind of a new thing, so there's not a ton of information about them, and traditionally speaking, are primary space marines armed with an execution or relic blade that are seen as chaplains in training. Now, I'm going to put a little note in here as I was a little bit confused when researching these guys, as in the 9th edition Space Marine Codex, it says that they have taken a vow of silence. Yet in the Indomitus novel, the Judiciar character speaks openly, and such a vow is never mentioned. This also occurs in the short story Nexus, which was included in the anthology Nexus and other short stories, wherein the Ultramarines encounter a Judiciar who is the last surviving member of his squad. And although he's kind of a shady character and keeps some things close to his vest, he has no problem talking to his fellow Marines. If we look at the Codex with a more critical eye, it says that they have taken a vow of silence and never preach aloud, thus using their deeds as their litany. So what I believe this means is that the vow of silence specifically relates to sermons and preaching rather than not speaking in any context. It's one of those things that I'm personally trying to get to the bottom of myself, so if you have a little bit more insight into this, then let me know all about it in the comments. Anyways, how somebody is selected for chaplaincy varies on a case-by-case -case basis, but traditionally speaking, one does not become a space marine aspirant with the sole purpose of eventually becoming a chaplain, like with the psychically gifted youths that are selected to eventually become librarians. Any space marine can become a chaplain at any point in their career. The reclusiarchs keep a watchful eye on all of their brothers for signs of fervent, unshaking devotion and specific traits that they believe would make them perfectly suited to enter the reclusium as one of their brothers. Grimaldus himself was famously a sword brother before becoming a chaplain, and then eventually inherited the role of reclusiarch several centuries later upon the death of his former master. Much like how each and every chapter has its own history, traditions, and customs, so too do their chaplains take on different roles and responsibilities depending on the chapter they are a part of. And in some of these chapters, the differences are so stark that they're not referred to as chaplains at all, 
and are in some senses a completely different unit, even though they share some fundamental principles. There are, for example, the wolf priests of the Space Wolves that are trained to act as a chaplain and an apothecary, tending to both the medical and spiritual needs of their brothers. They are the keepers of their chapter's history, traditions, and legends, and much like the apothecaries in other chapters, are also the ones that keep and watch over the chapter's gene seed. Similarly, the Iron Fathers of the Iron Hands take on the role of a tech marine as well. They are inspirational figures that guide the chapter's aspirants through the lifelong process of cybernetic augmentation. The Sanguinary Priests of the Blood Angels are chaplains that are also trained in the Legion-specific role of monitoring their brothers for signs of the manifestation of the Red Thirst. Due to their intimate knowledge of how this gene defect manifests, they are specifically trained in guiding their brothers back down into sanity when the curse begins to take a hold of them. Now, I'll briefly touch on the Traitor Legions, as although they did utilize chaplains during the Horus Heresy, as shown in the short story Distant Echoes of Old Night, which essentially is a short story about a Death Guard chaplain, their use seems to have mostly fallen out of practice, that is, with the exception of the Dark Apostles. These guys are the priesthood of the Ruinous Powers, and they devote their life to the propagation of their unholy word. In return for their loyalty, they are rewarded by their patrons through demonic auras of protection and blasphemous prayers that can manifest all manner of profane and unholy boon in their ally and bring about the ruination of their enemies. However, these guys have deviated so far from what we would consider a chaplain that we'll cover them in more detail in a separate video. Those who have been selected for the path of chaplaincy are only permitted entrance into the heart of their order, which is the chapter's reclusium, after they have passed the first of their chaplain trials and been gifted with their own rosarius. The reclusium itself is an immense chamber, dripping with spiritual significance that is watched over by the chaplains. Wherein most Space Marine battle barges have at least a handful of chapels, there is traditionally speaking only one reclusium and it is either on a chapter's homeworld, their equivalent base of operations on a moon or planetoid, or on their flagship if they are a fleet-based chapter. The chamber itself is adorned with ancient banners and objects of spiritual significance to the chapter, and many reclusiums pressed into alcoves and sockets within the walls can be found hundreds if not thousands of skulls from space marines of the past so they may continue to cast their eyeless gaze upon the members of their chapter in silent judgment. Other common relics that can be found displayed within these hollowed halls may take the form of a fragment of armor from a fallen company hero, the finest of power weapons waiting for a new hero to rise and carry them into battle, bolter casings from a particularly hard-won war in the chapter's past, the dirt of their homeworld, or countless journals filled with the wisdom of long-dead warriors. This is a realm of quiet contemplation, the stillness only interrupted by the chants of the chaplains themselves or the pitter-patter of thousands of bare feet from the scribes that work tirelessly to maintain the reclusium. The serfs work endlessly, pinning the chapter's long history of victories and great deeds upon seemingly endless parchment, and make sure that the thousands of candles within the reclusium stay lit forever. A fun fact, when the serfs die, the tallow will be removed from their bodies to create even more candles, surrendering their physical forms to the chapter so they may continue to serve even in death. It is also said of these serfs that many generations of them may spend the entirety of their life polishing a single relic blade. Sometimes after a particularly historic battle, these serfs may be deployed to scavenge the wreckage for bolter casings and discarded teeth of chain blades, seeking to acquire and preserve anything of significance to the chapter's legacy. Additionally, if the reclusium allowed one of its relics to be taken into battle and its wielder was slain, thus in turn losing said relic, if the relic was only of little significance, a team of hundreds of these serfs may be dispatched to reacquire it. But if it is deemed particularly significant, then a team of chaplains and their accompanying battle brothers will take to the field themselves. Now, some chapters take the recovery of lost relics to a completely different level. The Black Templars, for example, have been known to launch entire crusades to track down relics that have been taken by the enemy as spoils of war. It's not uncommon for a chapter to have thousands of scribes set to the task of pouring through ancient dust-covered tomes and sacred litanies that have been kept pristine in stasis vault since the days of the chapter's founding, desperately searching for clues about their ancient past, or fragments of speeches delivered long ago by their Primarch to gain but a glimpse into their patriarch's eternal wisdom. 
When it comes to the weapons and war gear utilized by the chaplains, they do technically have access to all of the sacred relics within their reclusium. However, these are traditionally only used in the most dire of circumstances or when their use has some form of spiritual significance for the particular engagement they're going to be involved in. More commonly, they have access to the standard issue war gear that all space marines do, be that chainsword, bolter, storm bolter, frag, crack grenades, or even power weapons. It's also pretty common for them to carry a pistol, and normally one of the plasma or grav variety. However, there are three pieces of war gear that are exclusive to the chaplains, and in my personal opinion, are absolutely iconic. These include the skull-faced helmet, the Crozius Arcanum, and the Rosarius. Although there are a few exceptions, the vast majority of the time, a chaplain's helm is carved to resemble a human skull an ancient symbol of death that is now used to mark the memory of the Emperor of Mankind's great sacrifice for humanity. It is, in a sense, his death mask, and to look it in the eye is to stand in front of his judgment. Space Marines that are caught in the chaplain's gaze will work even harder to achieve whatever impossible task has been laid before them, for failure would be to fall short in the eyes of the Emperor. The Crozius Arcanum, on the other hand, is both the primary badge of office for the chaplains, but it's also a devastating melee weapon in its own right, which is perfectly fitting for them, as battle against the enemies of mankind is the most worthy form of prayer and is symbolic of the Space Marines' primary function as instruments of war. The Crozius is normally topped with a double-headed Aquila of the Imperium or a winged skull. Though the mace has taken many different forms in the past, depending on the chapter's own unique history and symbolism. Many even have a brazier orb built into the pommel that breathes sacred incense and a gray mist that drifts behind the chaplain as they march into battle. Whereas in combat, the holy smoke rears to life like a wrathful serpent that coils about the wielder as the weapon rises and falls in death-dealing arcs. When its user thumbs its activation rune, the Crozius flares into crackling life its matter disruption field sparking with lethal force. In a similar manner to other blunt, concussive-based power weapons, the energy generated by the Crozius is only released when it makes contact, meaning that although it may not be as nimble as a power sword, nor as useful for parrying enemy attacks, it is far more energy efficient. When the weapon does make contact and its energy is released, it explodes with a wave of force that amplifies the strike a hundredfold obliterating unarmored targets into clouds of red mist and raining viscera. Many of these weapons actually have a sliding scale on their activation rune that allows the wielder to amplify or scale back exactly how much energy they intend to use. On their lowest setting, the weapon can be used to simply stun their opponent, which is useful if they intend to capture them alive for purposes of interrogation. Whereas when the chaplain cranks the power up to its highest setting, the Crozius is capable of obliterating even the heaviest of armors. The final piece of war gear that denotes a chaplain is a Rosarius. Now, this piece in particular is not actually exclusive to the chaplains, as indeed it's used by prominent members of the Ecclesiarchy as well. For both, it is considered a symbol of their office. The Rosariuses are actually created by the Ecclesiarchy and gifted to the chaplains as a symbol of understanding and unity between the two orders, even if this relationship is considered rocky at best. As the Space Marines in the Church don't exactly see eye to eye and don't share the same religious beliefs. It's actually not an uncommon belief for members of the Ecclesiarchy to not exactly trust the Space Marines, viewing them as a tool of war that needs to be kept on a short leash, as they remember all too well the horrors of the Horus heresy. The Rosarius is often seen as a symbol of understanding that the Space Marines may not worship the Emperor, but they will still venerate him and protect the Imperium from its enemies. The Ecclesiarchy's sacred text refer to the Rosarius as the soul's armor, as it is so much more than a pretty bauble. Inside each and every one of them is what is known as a conversion field emitter, a powerful personal force field that is able to convert the kinetic energy of an attack into nothing more than a harmless burst of radiant light. This combined with a chaplain's power armor or terminator armor in some situations makes them into a seemingly invulnerable death-dealing machine under the direct protection of the emperor himself. Before we move into the chaplain's early history, it's important that we understand the difference between the Imperial Truth and the Imperial Creed, as the Imperial Truth was set in place by the Emperor but came to be replaced by the Creed upon his entombment on the Golden Throne. 
When the Emperor of Mankind walked the stars, his imperial truth was a message to the nascent Imperium of Man to uphold the methodology of science and secular progress which had helped bring mankind to its first interstellar civilization. This ideology was meant to replace the outdated tradition of superstition. It was the Emperor's belief and subsequent mandate that in order for humanity to progress into the future, every man, woman, and child would need to abandon the practice of putting faith into non-existent deities, to instead put their faith in science, reason, logic, and understanding. This imperial truth taught humanity that the universe was rational, that the ultimate cure for fear was knowledge, and with knowledge came the banishment of the terrors of old night. It was the Emperor's belief that unity through this philosophy was the only way for humanity to survive and prosper in the face of a hostile galaxy, and thus declared that all worlds brought into the Imperium during the Great Crusade must adhere to its principles. I will quickly point out that he did make a one-time exception for the Tech Priest of Mars, but without getting into conspiracy theories, this was mostly done for political reasons, as they would not abandon their faith in the Machine God and their view of him as the avatar of the Omnissiah. When he met with them to sign the Treaty of Mars, he decided that it wasn't the best idea to push this issue any further as it risked starting a civil war between the two planets and would have been a really bad way to start off the Great Crusade. Of course, humanity never truly moved away from faith. It is something that is intrinsic to our species, something that we have practiced since the day we crawled out of the primordial muck. Isolated pockets of resistance existed throughout the Imperium where belief in higher powers and the realm of the spiritual continued in secret, and most ironically of all, many began to worship the Emperor himself as a god. Now, these groups remained secretive at first, using coded language to organize meetings and midnight sermons in the backs of boiler rooms on ships. But by the time of the Siege of Terra, Emperor worship was being done out in the open. There was even a point where Malkador the Sigilite became fascinated by an individual known as Euphrates Keeler, as she was seen as the first saint of the Emperor and was witnessed performing very real miracles even though she had no psychic ability. He would end up capturing her and attempting to study her to see if faith could be used as a weapon against the enemies of mankind, but that's a story for another video. Anyways, by the end of the Siege of Terra, the Emperor would end up entombed upon the Golden Throne. And without him there to directly interfere, his worship spread unchecked. By the time of the 41st millennium, it had become the dominant religion of mankind. The imperial truth would come to be replaced with the imperial creed, the belief that the emperor was and still is the one true god of humanity. A fun fact, the religion of emperor worship was built upon the foundation set in place by the word bearers, and the Imperium's holy book, the Laetitio Divinitatis, was originally penned by Lorgar Aurelian himself, the first of the Primarchs to be corrupted by the Chaos Gods. This is one of 40k's greatest ironies, and is a secret that, if ever revealed, could cause the Imperium to fracture beyond repair. Now, all chaplains have a fundamental understanding of the principles of the Imperial Creed, and a strained relationship with the Ecclesiarchy, but they still hold to the Emperor's original beliefs, with, again, the exception of a few chapters that do openly worship him as a god, but that's definitely not the norm. But speaking of Space Marines viewing the Emperor as a divine deity, the history of the chaplains begins with the most unlikely and most ironic of sources depending upon who you ask, the 17th Legion, the infamous Word Bearers. Prior to the existence of the chaplains came the 17th Legion, the only one of 20 to be given a title by the Emperor at their founding, as was their importance in his grand designs. They were called the Imperial Heralds, and it was the duty of the Legion to fight a war not just of territory and resources, but of ideas. It was the Legion's philosophy that they were constantly at war, even when not directly on the battlefield. Whereas warfare and physical conflict in all of its forms was the end-all be-all nature of other legions, for the 17th, their true battlefield was in the hearts and minds of men. This was a war that began long before the first bolt was fired and ended long after the enemy's cities were left in smoldering ruins. Battle was simply a single tool in the long war against the plague of belief. Even dating back to the Unification Wars on Terra, it was the Imperial Heralds who would protest the superstitions and faith that had bred during the Age of Strife. The 17th was chosen specifically for this role, as they were said to have been the firmest defenders and believers of the Imperial Truth. 
that the emperor was no god, that gods and deities did not exist, and for mankind to prosper, all false idols would need to be put to the pyres. Cleansed of the sin of mercy, the imperial heralds would deliver the emperor's ultimatum to all those that refused the imperial truth. They would announce their arrival on a world set to be brought into compliance, or a bastion of the Imperium's enemies by sending in only a single warrior, a space marine clad in black power armor, with their face hidden behind a leering skull, wielding a mace formed in the shape of a winged aquila. This warrior would offer the condemned a choice, repent, renounce their false idols, embrace the imperial truth, join with him and the rest of humanity under the emperor's guidance as the species stepped boldly into the future, or refuse and have everything and everyone that you have ever known be destroyed so thoroughly that all evidence that you and your people's wayward beliefs had ever existed at all would be rendered to nothing more than ash in the wind, your legacy purged from the annals of history, your culture left forgotten and unremembered. Some would wisely choose to heed this proto-chaplain's words and renounce their wicked ways, whereas others would take up arms and spit upon his offer. His brothers in gray ceramite would be notified of their decision and would come in shortly thereafter to carry out the sentence. Once an enemy was conquered, the Imperial Heralds would seek out works which spoke of the power of sorcery, false gods, and irrational beliefs. Libraries would be emptied, the contents divided into truth and falsity. Idols in the trappings of worship would be cast down and pulled from the temples and shrines. Any of the enemy that had survived would be given the choice once more. Embrace the Imperial Truth or join the pyre. And I know what you're thinking. Aside from the brutality of what they were doing, these guys don't really sound like the religious zealots that we know the word bearers to be today. Their firm adherence to the Imperial Truth seems to go against everything that we know about them. Well, the nature of the 17th being a bunch of iconoclasts would begin to change after their Primarch Lorgar was discovered on Colchis. If you know anything about Lorgar and his history, you know that he was a firm believer in the divinity of his father, something that he supposedly kept to himself in the early years of leading the Legion. But given that he was one of the most charismatic and influential people that ever lived, it didn't take long for his beliefs to spread like an infection throughout his Legion. But this isn't a video necessarily about the word bearers, so let's focus on what happened with the chaplains after Lorgar took the reins. Now, to say that Lorgar was a huge fan of the black-armored, skull-faced warriors that delivered the Emperor's judgment would be a massive understatement. He absolutely loved these guys and would take to calling them his chaplains over time and would grant them a much higher level of authority. It was said that they would become the moral strength of their brothers, the core of the Legion itself, and through the conviction of their words and nobleness of their deeds, they would inspire them to acts of ever-increasing greatness. Lorgar put a lot of emphasis into the importance of rite and ceremony. And thus, this would translate into a culture of symbolism for the 17th, a culture that could be observed most abundantly within the chaplains themselves. Whenever a world was to be sentenced to death or a people destroyed, the chaplains would carry out the act no longer in a manner of uncaring, remorseless drones. It was done with the solemnity of a rite. They would ritualistically take the ashes of a conquered planet and anoint the bowed heads of their brothers with them in remembrance of the Legion's accomplishment. Now, it was around the time shortly after Lorgar took the reins that all of the terminology that we commonly associate with religions would come to be part of the 17th's vernacular. Phrases like apostle, creed, anathema, and perhaps the most famous one of all, the most quintessential word in the entirety of Warhammer's lore, the 17th began the tradition of labeling beliefs, ideologies, and patterns of behavior that were antithetical to the imperial truth as heresy, and thus its perpetuators as heretics. Needless to say, these terms would also enter the vernacular of the chaplains, and even more so, all of the guidance that they would offer to their brothers, along with their speeches, rituals, lead gatherings, would start to take on more and more aspects of Lorgar's belief. To use real-world examples to better clarify what this change looked like, a chaplain's ceremony before looked more like a support group wherein he tended to the mental health of his brothers. These meetings still filled that purpose, but they started to look more like church gatherings, like a midnight mass, wherein the chaplain would also teach his fellows of the emperor's divinity. And don't get it twisted, this change was super gradual at first and took place over many years. It didn't just all happen overnight. 
We'll get into the Legion's history much more thoroughly in a word bearer's deep dive, but to summarize what happened afterwards, the inevitable outcome of this would be that eventually the Emperor would catch wind of what was going on with the 17th Legion, and would confront Lorgar and his sons. He would denounce their beliefs and then destroy Lorgar's prized city of Monarchia that had been formed into the center of Emperor worship, symbolically and quite literally bringing down his fiery condemnation upon the symbol of his divinity. This would lead the Wordbearers and Lorgar to go through a period of mourning, wherein they sought to find deities worthy of their devotion. They would, of course, end up finding the Chaos Gods, and this would lead to the Horus Heresy. Fun fact, although the Wordbearers' chaplains originally wore black power armor, they would briefly change it to red when Lorgar gave them more authority within the Legion. They would, however, change it back after the Emperor rendered his judgment, the black paint now symbolizing the Ashes of Monarchia. So if the early history of the chaplains indicates that they were a unit within the Word Bearers Legion, how did they end up spreading to the rest of the Space Marines? Well, this is because of the Council of Nikea, and if you're not familiar with it, this is where concerns had been raised by many of the Space Marine Legions over the usage of psychic powers. The Council was called to debate whether or not psychically gifted Space Marines, i.e. the Librarians, should continue to be used. After a lot of back and forth, the Emperor rendered his judgment that all psychic powers were to be banned, the Librarian program dismantled, and all psychically gifted Space Marines were to abandon their positions as Librarians and be folded back into the Legion as standard battle brothers. Now, Malkador the Sigilite, who was in attendance and is considered by most to be the right hand of the Emperor, was not convinced that all of the Space Marines would uphold this verdict. As for many of them, the deployment of the sorceress arts had become a cornerstone of how they conducted war. He needed something that would ensure that the librarians didn't continue their practices in secret, and thus his thoughts turned to Lorgar and his chaplains. They had been remarkably efficient at dealing with the mental, psychological, and emotional needs of their brothers. They would be the perfect instrument for guiding the librarians out of their position back into being just a regular space marine. Now, it is true that the word bearers had lost their way for a brief period in time and had started worshiping the emperor as a god, but after a little bit of tough love and the burning of Monarchia over a hundred years ago, from all outside perspectives, the word bearers were once again presenting as a truly exceptional Space Marine Legion and were conquering worlds left and right. They didn't really have any reason to doubt them at this point. Thus, Malkador created what was known as the Chaplain Edict that called for all of the Primarchs from each legion that employed the use of psychers to instead now promote their warriors that had proven to be the most loyal into chaplains. To help with this process, Lorgar was to send Wordbearer's chaplains of his own to all of the legions, on one hand to actually serve as a chaplain and make sure the Edict of Nikea was upheld, but on the other hand, to teach their brothers all of their traditions and methods to ensure the successful creation of their own chaplains. And fun fact, several of the legions actually already had specifically trained individuals that already filled the role of a chaplain. There was the Iron Fathers of the Iron Hands, the Wardens of the Blood Angels, and legionaries known as the Voices of Fire within the Salamanders. Whereas with legions like the Sallies, the Voices of Fires would go on to become chaplains in their own right, emerging their beliefs and practices with those of more traditional chaplains, whereas the Iron Hands and the Blood Angels continued the use of their own version for the most part unchanged. Now, the great irony in all of this is that Lorgar at this point had already discovered the Chaos Gods and was fully corrupted. Whether or not the chaplains that were sent out as emissaries had given themselves over to the ruinous powers already, though, is still a hotly debated subject. Each and every one of them probably fell in a different location on the spectrum of dogmatic and loyal servant of the Emperor to full-blown heretic. In my research, I was able to find two references to the Word Bearer's chaplains being embedded in other legions. The first was in the novel Fear to Tread, wherein a former Blood Angels librarian has a flashback to the day they came to take away his psychic mantle. It was a warden of the legion that did the honor, but he was accompanied by several chaplains in black power armor that are assumed to have been from the Word Bearers. Later on in the novel, it's observed that chaplains of the Word Bearers had met with Sanguinius, but he turned down the offer of them being embedded within their ranks, as he already had the Wardens, and thus the task of policing the reformation would be left to them. The second scene is from the novel Deliverance Lost, where the drop site massacre had already happened, and 75,000 Raven Guard now lay dead on Istvan. Korax returns to what remains of his legion, enraged by his brother's betrayal. 
There's a scene where one of the Wordbearer's chaplains that had been with the Raven Guard had been imprisoned, and when the Primarch comes in, he seems genuinely relieved, thinking that he's going to clear up any misconception or miscommunication that was taking place. But that's not what happens at all. Korax immediately accuses him of being a traitor, a spy for the Word Bearers. The chaplain tells him that that's not true at all, that he was here under Malkador's order to uphold the Council of Nikea, and Korax tells him to shut his mouth, informing him of what had just happened on Istvan. Now, the scene is a little strange, because this Word Bearer does genuinely appear to not have any idea what's going on. He doesn't believe that his legion would do such a horrible, genocidal thing. But Korax isn't hearing any of it, and in his rage, he grabs him by the throat, slams him up into the ceiling, and snaps his neck. When we read this scene, our first inclination is that Korax's rage is certainly justifiable, but he just murdered an innocent marine. Although later in the book, it's revealed that Korax was able to smell something on him. Something that he doesn't understand, but it was the same scent that the other word bearers had at Istvan, and it's implied to us as the audience that this is the smell of corruption. Explicitly, it is the scent of chaos. It's one of those things that's meant to be ambiguous and inspired debate, but for me personally, I think I trust Korax's judgment here. Although the intentions of the Wordbearer's chaplains were questionable to say the least, it was undeniable that they served a profound purpose within their legion, and their skills of oration, inspiring presence, and ability to provide mental and spiritual well-being it was ultimately seen as a net positive. So the role of chaplain would end up becoming a permanent fixture within the Adeptus Astartes going forward. Now, what ultimately ended up happening to all of the Wordbearer specific chaplains that had been embedded in the other legions is not something I have found a direct answer to. But it's not difficult to believe that what Korax ended up doing probably took place in the other legions as well. They would have been seen as spies and an enemy to the Imperium. With how bombastic and over the top the Warhammer 40k setting can often be, it's all too easy for us to forget the humanity of the Space Marines. They're often depicted as these unthinking, uncaring machines of war, tools of the Imperium designed to wage unending war in the Emperor's name, individuals who have ascended their humanity, who have transitioned to something far beyond mankind, the transhuman super soldiers, the Emperor's angels. However, despite what the Imperial propaganda would have its citizens believe, the Space Marines are still human. And no matter how much gene therapy they are given, no matter how much hypno-indoctrination they are subjected to, buried beneath their black carapace and underneath their fused ribcage still beats the heart of a man. They are not immune to the hardships of war. They mourn their fallen brothers. They grieve for the worlds they failed to save. And their rage and hatred of the enemy can often boil up and be directed against undeserved targets. I find it genuinely kind of beautiful that there's an entire order of space marines whose primary purpose is to offer guidance to their wayward brothers, to teach them of their chapter's history and be there for them when things are their darkest. To be a chaplain is to live a life without cowardice or shame, your ferocity without limit, your wisdom unquestioned, and your faith unequaled. It is to lead through example with every action you take and every word that you speak, for to walk in the Emperor's light as one of his holy avatars, weakness and doubt are sins that you are not permitted. To their brothers, they are the wisdom and teachings of their chapter given human form. They are a walking reminder of who they are and what they are fighting for, and stand as proof that the light of a better tomorrow continues to endure even in the suffocating darkness of the grimdark future. I want to close this video out with one final excerpt from the novel Purging of Catalysts. It isn't one of fiery speeches or bloody battlefields. No heroic deeds are done in the name of the Emperor, and not a single bolt shell is ever fired. For all intents and purposes, it is an incredibly quiet moment. For context, Chaplain Boreas has managed to reclaim a Dark Angel's Basilica, and now stands atop its tallest spire to overlook the city and better assess the tactical situation. The battle for Pisinia still rages, and he knows that the orcs will eventually figure out what has happened. Soon, there will be blood, fire, and death. But in this moment, everything is still. Boreas lingered for a short while longer. It was doubtful the orcs would know yet that the Basilica was again in the hands of the Space Marines. 
He unfastened the seals on his helmet and took it off, filling his lungs with the Bassinia air. The salt of the sea, the smoke of explosions, the soot of chimneys, the tang of blood from the orc bodies below, all combined into a melange of sensation. His eye fell upon one of the stone guardian angels atop the wall. Its left wing had been broken at some point in the fighting, alone amongst all of them. The missing piece lay on the roof behind the wall, its intricately carved feathers chipped. He hung his crozias from his belt and picked up the broken wing, turning it over in his fingers. He reached to the belt pouch below his backpack and brought out a slab of two-part resin that was used to make rapid battle repairs to armor. He kneaded the putty into a blob and delicately fixed the broken wing back in place, discarding the surplus resin over the parapet. It was a poor fix, but it would do. When the orcs were driven from Bassinia, he would have one of the chapter serfs effect a cleaner, permanent repair. It didn't matter that fires raged in Catalyst Harbor and the rest of Basilica was half in ruins. Here, where he stood, everything was as it should be, or as close as he could get it. What was the point of being a chaplain if one let the small things go unnoticed?